So it's 9.58 and we have five people waiting and I'm just going to let them in. I see some fami familiar faces or names, I should say. It's good. So good morning, folks. We'll just give everybody another couple of minutes and then we'll start our webinar number four in our five part series. So it's raining here in Saskatoon. Does anybody want to weigh in from across Saskatchewan? Maple Creek, Esteban, Humboldt. Hey, it's been rainy here for a couple of days, but it's stopped right now. So we'll see, see what happens. Oh, that's Esteban, by the way, everybody. <laughs> Morning. Yes, the Humboldt region. We got lots of rain overnight. So I know there's some farmers itching to get back in the fields, but it's still pretty wet out our way. Morning, everyone. Well, we could, uh, they need it out west. It needs to go farther west. I just came back from Vancouver yesterday and, you know, it's very topical of, in terms of what's happening out there. Raining in Leader, raining in Regina, raining in Maple Creek. So it's a provincial phenomena. Okay, well, it's 10 o'clock. I'm respectful of everyone's time. Welcome. I would like to acknowledge this morning that as a provincial organization, CETA uh, is located within and serves mm -hmm. treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10 territories and the homeland of the Métis. And this morning, I'm very excited to have two special guests from Manitoba with us. We'll let the uh, some newcomers join us this morning here. Before I continue, excited to have uh, Margot Cathcart and Eve O'Leary. I'm I'm going to give a very brief introduction to to both of our guests. Margot is CEO of the Rural Manitoba Economic Development Corporation. And we're gonna call that RMED this morning for short. Uh, Margot grew up in rural Manitoba and she graduated from Brandon University. After living in Japan and Winnipeg, she returned to Brandon to raise her family. She self-describes herself as a builder. She's been involved on the ground up in uh, product business industry development, a lot of private sector experience ranging from television information management, technology, ag, and financial services. Uh, most recently, she's held senior management positions with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development, and she's developing um, provincial, province-wide, excuse me, economic development programming and re-engineering operations to enhance knowledge management and operational efficiency. So thanks for being with us this morning, Margo. And then we have Eve O'Leary, who I refer to as a, an expat from Saskatchewan. She did land here after Ireland on her way to Manitoba. Uh, Eve assumed the role of Director for Economic Development of Portage Regional Economic Development, where she's fulfilling her passion and an aptitude, which I'm aware of, uh, for building relationships, attracting investments, promoting tourism, strategic planning, and overseeing board governance. Since her relocation to Canada from Ireland in 2014, Eve has demonstrated unwavering commitment to enhancing her proficiency in economic development through completion of numerous credentials, uh, including our Saskatchewan credential, the uh, Prof uh, Professional Community Economic Development designation. She's also completed programs and certificates from the University of Waterloo, as well as the Technical Aboriginal Economic Developer from CANDU. So, and recently again from Manitoba, just noticing here the Community Edge 
certification program in Manitoba. Congratulations, Eve, for being awarded that designation. And thank you for being with us this morning. So to start off with, again, um, just housekeeping, uh, our guests, we can ask our audience to, to please keep yourself on mute uh, until we finished our initial discussion, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Uh, you can certainly put your questions in the chat or uh, raise your hand uh, when we finish discussing some initial points here with Eve and Margot. So to start off with, I'd, I'd like to set the stage with a discussion on capacity on supports for economic development in Manitoba. Uh, so my first question, and we'll start with Margo, does the province currently provide any direct funding to municipalities or regional groups for economic development? Well, I'll let Eve speak to the funding that, you know, may or may not be um, given to municipalities and how that works. But for ARMED as an economic development agency, we do receive an annual uh, funding envelope. We're a new organization, and so we're two years old. And we're just at the point now where we're looking at extending and expanding what those funding sources are. Our role is not to provide funding to communities, but to develop a suite of programming that's common across what everybody needs. So you hear, you'll hear, you hear me talk about readiness over and over and over again. We try and have a suite of programs available that help communities depending upon what their personal state of readiness is and whether that is investment attraction or whether it's tourism or what pro tourism product development because the marketing we have um tours in manitoba but we do look at those sorts of things so as an example within our funding envelope we have created a data site it's in the uh chat if anybody wants to take a look at it that's a site that provides consistent data across all programs and services. So it's a resource that's made for communities and provides that, that continuity. Um, and there's a number of different things that we'll talk about through the course of, of this morning. Um, we'll expand on them. So we're not the funder, but we do provide that kind of continuity and that sort of standardized service to communities where they may not be able to afford specialized skills themselves. Super. We're looking forward to hearing more about your, your offerings, Margo. Eve, are you able to speak into direct funding? Sure. Uh, uh, so we receive, um, so I work for Portage Regional and Economic Development, which is a shared funded entity from the city of Portage of Prairie and the ORM of Portage of Prairie. We don't receive any direct funding from the province of Manitoba unless it's a, a specified grant that we can apply for programming. Um, and I would say that this unique collaboration between the city and the ORM has definitely been a, a huge asset uh, through a sharing agreement. We have uh, in, um, attracted over $1.2 billion of investment. And that's because the uh, municipalities got together and understand the importance of leveraging their assets for economic development. So not directly from the province, but we are funded directly from both municipalities. So does the pro did I hear you correctly? You, you indicated that project funding is available from the yes, province? Yes, sometimes. So uh, example, this year uh, we're completing a new CRM system and a regional economic development strategy. And we did apply through the Build and Sustainable Communities Grant for programming from the province of Manitoba, and that was 50 cents on the dollar. Okay, good, yeah. good. Glad to hear that. Okay, um, in terms of rural and urban, the nexus of, of the two, so in many jurisdictions, and Saskatchewan is, is one of them, where we have a plethora of rural communities in two large urban Saskatoon and Regina, there can be sometimes a sense of competition between rural and urban. Now, Manitoba is a different environment. Eve, can you speak to that at all? Is there any divide or nexus of rural um... and urban? I, I think it's important to know that every community outside your own community is a competition. Um, so whether it's provincial or it's another community, um, for us, we have like rural Manitoba and then we have Winnipeg. So uh, we definitely try to utilize our regional partners such as Ormed uh, when we're working for larger investment attraction. But the one thing I'd say about smaller communities, it doesn't have to be a competition. Um, I think it's really important that you leverage those relationships with the bigger metropolitan cities because um, before Ormed, 
um, had uh, been here, um, we, we found it very hard to uh, gather data, um, which now ORMED is doing for Portage, but uh, we used to use the likes of Economic Development Winnipeg and those bigger profiles and more than happy to share any information they had. So um, competition, yes, you're always going to have competition, but I think it's really important to know that what is your community's unique selling propositions? We're all the center of uh, the universe. We're, we all have great people, but really what that, what is that? Like, so for Portage La Prairie, uh, we have um, the world's largest Coke can or the world's largest pea processing facility. We have 2000 businesses, over 21,000 amazing people directly on the Trans-Canada Highway. And we have CP and CN, where uh, it's the only place in Canada where they converge. So it's really important when you talk about competition to know what your community is selling and uh, working with those larger communities will definitely help you uh, gain access to that in terms of the comparative as well. So, you know, is it water, is it taxes? Uh, really understand what that competition is and I uh, use it to your advantage. Margo, can you weigh in on the rural urban from your oh, perspective? Absolutely. absolutely. Um, and I think you've made some really great points there around understanding your advantages and, and you know, the, the ability to work collaboratively within your region and, you know, from a, from a rural agency and, and perhaps for everybody's benefit here, our mid's responsibility is from the 53rd parallel south, with the exception of the city of Winnipeg proper, but we have a shared responsibility for the metro region. Um, and so we've got 250,000 square kilometers. And so when, depending upon where we talk, there, the definition of rural urban becomes quite different. So every community, whether they want to admit it or not, has a certain amount of perimeteritis. So you go to Dauphin and it's Grandview and Gilbert Plains to say, well, they never think outside of Dauphin. And you go to Brandon and it's the rivers that are saying the same thing. So this, this co concept of um, rural urban divide, it doesn't have to be a very, very large metropolitan center for the theme to still hold true. So what we're noticing is um, that we are competing across the country to maintain residents, to we look at youth mobility, the province takes that very seriously. We've just funded a project um, by the province that's being ran out of the Canada West Foundation, looking at youth mobility and why people are leaving. How do we attract people to come back? What are some of the things that are happening there? And it's it's early days, but anecdotally, we're talking a lot about things like being able to do skill development in communities so that we can maintain people in communities what is the role of business and making sure that they're able to provide that kind of on the job training in order to be able to maintain and stay in rural communities. Um, we're very interested in rural business succession planning and what does that mean in order to be able to not just maintain the business but the population as well. And then you look at some of the issues around things like connectivity, um, health care, uh, people quote me as talking about kids having this spot to put you know, their bums in swings and those sorts of things, because more and more we're seeing uh, big C community economic development um, really having a, an impact on the big E. People are, especially after COVID where pe businesses are locating where the people in the workforce are, they're not expecting their workforce necessarily to move to them. So maintaining that population, is a big part of, of the economic development piece as well. On the Canada West research on youth, is that a Manitoba scope? It's a Manitoba scope. They did a, okay. a, a one in um, Alberta as well. And I know that there's conversations happening at a provincial level in Saskatchewan on some similar research. Um, and I believe that's ha happening with the province itself themselves. But um, I don't have a lot of detail on it, Verona, but if you're interested, sure. I can give you a connection afterwards. That's okay, good, super. Now, um, investment attraction, Eve has already talked about that, and your new data site is is targeted to supporting that. What else is Armed doing um, on the to support rural, support your communities in your uh, within your scope on on IA investment attraction? Well. 
as I said, we're we're a new agency, so we've got lots of things that are just emerging. So in Manitoba, we really are trying to take a team Manitoba approach. The, the goal is to have the business somewhere in Manitoba, first and foremost, and making sure that it's the right businesses in the right community in order to meet the, the community strategy, but also to make sure the business can come and succeed based on the needs that they have, whether it's water or energy or wastewater transportation that you know the list goes on and on and so really being able to try and work with invest canada work with economic development winnipeg to be able to make those connections um we recently attended nipam um one of these days someone will tell me what that actually stands for but it's a very large um investment show in khan and so we went over and it was the first time that um, Armed and EDW has participated together in a show like that. And it was a Canadian pilot project hosted by the Canadian Real Estate Association, the Manitoba Real Estate Association, EDW, and ourselves. And we took three communities with us um, from a rural per perspective. EDW had three properties in Manitoba, in the city that they represented, and we were in a shared booth space there. So that's that's a long-term play where we're able to be able to start to build a profile, not just of, of Winnipeg, but of rural Manitoba broadly. And we have came away with some fantastic leads and we're looking at it being sort of a three to four year pipeline. So we're not expecting things to happen quickly. So we're looking, we are looking at that. Um, we're working with a number of um immigration consultants within the province that have clients that are looking at coming to Manitoba and wanting to identify businesses that they can purchase. And we've noticed that there's a big disconnect between what uh, a, a, um, a multiplier like an immigration consultant can find in the marketplace and how quickly they can bring people in. And so the businesses that are listed for sale with a realtor or their lawyer, they want to move now, but we still need that sort of three-year window three to, to bring someone in from an immigration perspective. So by identifying people that are looking for longer-term transitions, we're hoping to be able to bridge those um, the people that are interested and the people that are interested in a longer or willing to have that longer succession plan. We've got the data that, that's there. Uh, we've got a number of communities that aren't ready for investment attraction, but they know it's in their plans. And so we're working on some toolkits and guides and worksheets and those sorts of things that'll help them in that preparedness. So again, we try and have the right service offering depending upon the readiness of the community. And obviously, um, Eve was one of the ones that are you know well advanced down that readiness pathway. And they were one of the ones that we took to MIPM as part of that package of, of municipalities. So just some clarity, Armed, um, are you are an incorporated nonprofit, correct? Are you? Yes. Um, and your funding envelope is provided by the province of Manitoba? At this point, it is exclusively with the province, but we have a number of projects that we are in the early design stages for that we'll be looking for project funding with as well. Okay, so you're just on the IA, the investment attraction, your responsibilities that you've outlined are very similar to what the province of Saskatchewan undertakes. So does the province of Manitoba, are you hand in hand in, in terms of investment attraction or have they been delegated to your organization? Essentially? Uh, no, we work hand in hand with Economic Development Winnipeg with the department, uh, the government department, as well as with the Economic De Development Board Secretariat in doing investment attraction. So we, it can really vary. So we've been involved in uh, very early stages with someone who says, you know what, I'm interested in Manitoba and we have a conversation and then we would introduce them to appropriate communities based on their needs. Um, in some cases, communities will invite us in with they maybe the first or second point of contact and say, hey, we've got this investment opportunity. Can you provide us data? Can you join us at a meeting? Can you you know, do whatever it is that they're needing. Um, in some cases, we may be working with multiple communities because a decision hasn't been made. Once a decision is made to locate in a specific community, we tend to move a little bit more to the background and let the community take the leadership role, but we're always there to support as required. 
the province will come to us and say, we've been approached or we've had a referral. How do you think this might work? Um, where could it go? And then we'll, then we'll be supporting at a provincial level and following on their leadership. In some cases that will come from Economic Development Winnipeg. So we've got a, a client we're working with right now that has a number of people that are interested in that business succession immigration pathway. Uh, they're looking primarily at ag businesses. And so we're taking a lead on that, even though the contact came through Economic Development Winnipeg. So it's still early days with this new model and we're still kind of working our way through it, but it's very much a collaborative approach. Definitely, it sounds very unique. Okay, Eve, I'm gonna circle back to Eve. So Eve's an early adopter in the investment attraction space. Um, and you mentioned earlier that with your partnership, you've been able to leverage 1.2 billion. Was that was that billion with a B, Eve? That was in 2019, that's billion with a B. But recently with the help of Ormed, the province, um, we have attracted $1.9 billion for another uh, company for sustainable aviation uh, field. And like that, um, leads can come in from anywhere. They can come in from Ormed, they can come in from the province, they can come in from the client themselves, they can come in from many of the different economic development departments at the federal government as well. The main thing is that we do take a team Manitoba approach and make sure that they do get to the province because we understand like just with the city and the ORM, what's good for the city is good for the ORM and vice versa. And the province are very aware of that as well. So uh, we have different communication trees and our definite unique concierge service for investment attraction and the way we do that here specifically in Portage of Prairie is unique. So we have our internal investment team, the CAO, city manager, director of planning, director of ActDev, operations and utilities, all sit on that uh, first meeting with the uh, with the client. And then we do bring in the likes of Ormed, Invest in Canada or the province, depending on what their needs are at the time. So definitely a collaborative approach. Um, and uh, this, City and the ORM, I will say as well, did enter into a tax sharing agreement. So what's good for the city is good for the ORM and vice versa. And from there, they've done economic development. They've done that with planning, the library, recreation. And I think uh, recently it was a new daycare, which opened up 73 spots. So that um, tax sharing agreement and regional approach has certainly been uh, what's uh, allowed us to invest that amount of dollars into our community. Good for you. Um, do you engage with any other rural municipalities outside of the immediate RM? Um, it's kind of hard for me too because I'm also the chair of EDAM as well, and I also do sit uh, with Margo on the Ormed board as well. So, um, Manitoba is definitely friendly Manitoba, so we do intertwine. Um, I'm a very passionate EDO. I, I'm very grateful to a lot of people actually around this table who have definitely opened up their knowledge um, when I first started out in economic development. So uh, we do try to connect with other people in other rural communities, um, uh, not directly Verona, but um, definitely from a, an economic development professional point of view. Okay, so Eve, what about uh, business retention and expansion? Um, I often say here it's it's not as sexy as investment attraction, but it's really foundational, right? Um, it's foundational and probably more important than the investment attraction piece. Um, and I think what you. happens with EDOs is, is we get so bogged down on the theory of business retention and expansion that we don't understand we're actually physically doing it. So I call it reactive and proactive business retention and expansion. Um, after COVID hit, uh, we did try to formally launch a formalized proactive approach. It didn't work. People are too busy. They just, you know, unless you're really giving them value at the time of what the EDO office does, it's not really going to work. But our really main point there was to gather the data. So we started off, we developed a brand new business registry list. Uh, we can now count the openings, closings, succession planning, um, so we did get out and do a brief uh, meeting with all the businesses. Uh, I wouldn't say it's as formalized as where we want it to go. We are doing a, a brand new CRM system this year, along with our regional economic development strategy and a formalized BRI uh, will be uh, intertwined into those uh, that organizational 
uh, strategy as well. So uh, it's very important, but just know that the reactive informal uh, referrals that come from your board or council or a struggling business uh, is just as good as doing proactive business retention, as long as you're meeting their needs and logging the data um, for benchmarking. So, okay. Are, are you doing, is it a custom CRM you're going to set up? Or? Yeah, a custom one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. If you're having so, issues with the federal government for uh, privacy acts at the moment. So uh, we found a company that we really feel would be very beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Margo, is uh, Armed in the uh, business retention expansion space in terms of supports or programs that you're offering? Absolutely. And I echo everything that Eve has said and, and that you have said. It's really the bread and butter of economic development is making sure that you're building and growing from within, because that's where the most growth is going to come. And, and the one thing I, I always say to economic development agencies, officers, leadership, um, don't get caught up in the pressures of the, the fancy, sexy press release because you've been chasing unicorns and smokestacks because they they do happen, but they happen because you've got a vibrant community for that business to come to. And if you don't have that vibrant BRE program in the first place, you're not going to get the others because they don't want to come to some place that looks like they're stagnant. So you need to have that growth. You need to have that foundation in order to, because it's a fundamental piece of your attraction strategy as well. Um, so definitely it's an important thing. You know, I, I completely, um, sympathize with Eve's comments around trying to do it on a proactive basis versus a reactive basis. I think especially in this post-COVID era, it's um, even more important that we understand as, as economic development leadership where things businesses are at and what's going on. Um, but it is hard to get that time with people right now because they're still in recovery mode. They're still trying to do that. So trying to chip away at getting that um, proactive program and that structured program is, is very important. Um, we actually have five toolkits that are going to be coming out in the next little bit. Um, I mentioned the foreign direct investment one. The next one is business retention expansion. Business retention expansion. We have one on measuring economic development uh, success and progress. We've got one on strategic planning. And the fifth one I always forget is... Um, well, oh, marketing your 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 community, sort of a destination marketing type of of um, theme, and so those will be coming out. They're just in various stages of proofreading and typesetting, and and all of those sorts of things. So we're optimistic we will get them out before the uh well, into early fall. But we have this pesky thing called an election going on, and uh, we just have to see whether or not we're going to be able to get them posted or whether it'll fall under the blackout. I think we're, I think we'll be okay because we've announced. So, okay. Okay. Congratulations on, on your forthcoming toolkits. So I want to touch on housing, which is a, a tough one. Um, we're just programming again, we're, we're fine tuning our agenda for our provincial summit, uh, which is coming up in October. And for those online who haven't registered, we have launched a virtual option now as well. Uh, we're, we're bringing together several sessions on housing and looking for the, those um, solutions that maybe we, you know, again, we, we're not touching on to, to a greater degree in, in rural, uh, different models, modular, uh, perhaps private-public uh, partnerships. Do you see anything outside the box happening in Manitoba, Margo, in terms of housing solutions that might be non-traditional? Mm, definitely. I've got two examples. In fact, we're, we'll be doing case studies on them, I think, in the next year. One is um, a friendship center that has slowly taken over the management of public housing in their community. And they've tied that into a bunch of their other programming. And through that, have been able to expand the number of housing units that are available for um, lower income situations. And they've had fantastic success, not just with being able to expand the number of doors that are available, but also in uh, being able to look at some of the things that traditional public housing has really struggled with, maintenance, uh, upgrades, safety, security, all of those sorts of things. So they've done a, a fantastic job on that. There's another community where the credit union 
a local developer and a construction company have gotten together and they have developed a program where they've opened 600 units in their community, give or take. And the, um, all three of the partners are taking a lower margin in order to be able to make sure that there's the development of the housing. And so there's a two year take back clause on the property. Uh, they've got reduced mortgage rates. Um, they are taking a lower uh, down payment um, and they're being able to develop housing that way. So there's some really interesting uh, models happening there as well. Uh, we also have a company in uh, Manitoba um, that is doing some really incredible things with Northern housing in First Nation communities, where they've got um, it's jointly owned with one of the one of the First Nations. They're doing sending a lot of housing north over the ice roads, so they're working on um, housing where. They've got safety glass for all of the windows, so it protects from sticks, stones, antlers, all of those sorts of things that happen. Mold resistant, fire resistant, built in fire um, prevention systems, um, rot proof, mold proof. They're, so they really have a, an interesting solution to some of those First Nation Northern housing um, concerns, and they think they may have some opportunities to address water treatment in, in the, those communities as well. So their big challenge right now is um, being able to cash flow inventory because if you have to build it all and then wait for the ice roads, you've got a lot of money sitting tied up waiting um, for that very short window of time to be able to move these houses in. So uh, interesting things happening in that space. Well, I'm really glad to hear it. I mean, those these are, this is some of the innovation we need to see in housing. Uh, on the 600 units where the partners are coming together, are you able to share what community that is or that company? Uh, Steinbeck. Oh, okay. Yeah. Super. All right. Thank you. Eve, uh, what's going on with housing in Portage? Well, um, there has been lots and lots of multifamily residential units. So since uh, Roquette and Simplod, um, put that investment into the community. We've had about 450 units built since then, and there still is a lot more to come. Um, this year, I think we're having about 320 units being built. So lots of the multifamily residential sector. We are getting investors that are interested in uh, modular housing. However, you know, looking at zoning and bylaws, like we really need to update a lot of those policies as well. So Nothing very as innovative as, as Margot has been talking about, but definitely we're open to that. So one of the things we're doing to make sure we're prepared for a lot of this investment happening in the community is to undertake a socioeconomic impact assessment. So we'll be undertaking that this winter to really understand the impacts, focusing on housing, education, health, transportation, and really understanding uh, where we need to go. The city of Portage La Prairie did undertake an affordable housing strategy as well. That's just in the finalization stage as well. And then we're hoping to, once our regional economic development strategy is completed, identify where we need to go in terms of housing, um, especially for single family residential as well. So. Okay, good for you. So the the last element I'd like to speak to, and then we can open it up to questions, is um, it's in the area of municipal and First Nation partnerships. So Eve, I know that this is a, an area of interest to, uh, of yours. Is that something that you're engaged in right now um, in your current position in terms of partnering with, uh, with nations in Manitoba? Mm -hmm. Uh, without a doubt, my role in economic development entails a lot more than the municipal facets. Um, and that's why I'm a firm believer that for me to be a municipal ADO, I also need to be certified and understand Indigenous economic development. And that is why I did go through the Can Do program. And I do attend their professional development and annual conferences uh, to expand um, that knowledge. Um, recently, um, so just for those who don't know where Portage de Prairie is, Portage de Prairie is just 45 minutes east of Winnipeg and we are located on Treaty 1 and we have three First Nation communities that surround us in our area. Uh, last week or I think the week beforehand we were honoured to work with DOTC. Uh, they hosted a Taiwanese delegation which I know Ormed 
um, was involved in as well. Um, and that was for a MOU on economic trade and serving as a bridge between the OTC and the Taiwanese delegation. So really um, proud to be involved as a navigator there, uh, providing logistics. Uh, I would say that um, like anything, especially for municipal and First Nation relationships, it takes time to build meaningful relationships. And it's something that I encourage all EDOs to be reaching out to the uh, chief and council and economic development team in those communities. So uh, for us, when an investor comes to the community, it makes it a lot easier when we know chief and council in our partner and communities uh, to be able to navigate them to those communities as well. So uh, working on it and uh, excited to see where the next few years uh, take us, Verona. Okay, super. And Margo, um, do you have any insight again based on your provincial lens? Well, you know what, it's, um, I still from time to time, unfortunately hear from First Nation communities that they feel like they're being approached as a means to funding as opposed to people coming in and looking for really true meaningful relationships. And that makes me very sad because I think it um, it really undermines the work that Eve has done, the work that others are doing, where they're, the work that Armid's trying to do in building real solid, deep, meaningful relationships. So we as an agency have purposely taken it um, slower than many would like because people don't know who we are. We have no history. We have no um, background that they can look to to say that, yes, we're really um, in, in, intending to be in this space for the long term. Um, that said, we've had some really, really fantastic opportunities. I had a, a young Métis entrepreneur um, into my office this morning uh, talking about the expansion of their business. Um, one of our EDOs, Sharon Gu Charlene Gulak, is working with a city-funded um, municipal First Nations project looking at developing a regional strategy, and that's with Mossy River and Skelnan First Nation. Uh, that area also has a number of municipalities, First Nations, and um, Northern Affairs communities that have come together and they're looking at how they can do shared water treatment. And we've got a leadership role in being able to facilitate and navigate some of those conversations. Um, the housing company I mentioned, we've done some fantastic work with them. And they were one of the companies that we took with us to the International Economic Forum of Americas in Montreal and um, had the opportunity to be able to facilitate conversations with uh, you know, the vice chair of the Bank of Montreal from a funding and financial perspective. Um, we're working with, um, we just signed an NDA with a company that's working on uh, a very interesting model to solve uh, broadband issues in remote communities. And so we're just waiting to hear more about what's happening with that now that the NDA is signed, um, and hopefully we'll be able to move forward. We met them again at the International Economic Forum of Americas in Montreal. Um, Scott was one of the presenters there. And so um, one of the things that ARMED is able to do is be able to get out into those kinds of forums and make connections and then bring those introductions back so we can go out. And you've got one organization going with this provincial-wide view of things and then being able to match make it the relationships again based on readiness and individual community strategies and and those sorts of things because it's not realistic for every community to go everywhere so we can go and facilitate those things so the more we're brought into the conversations with communities uh first nations local government um municipal city, whoever it is, the easier it is for us to be able to make those connections. Because if we're not part of your team and your inner circle, then we can't make those connections. And so it's it's a bit of a, a try and, tried and true process around all of that. One of the things that we're doing in terms of being able to really um, build those relationships and make sure that we're looking at economic reconciliation and the partnership with municipalities and First Nations is developing an advisory council. And so in the coming weeks, I've got a very long list of meetings um, that are established that we've been working on the, the concept for 
um, a while, but now that we've got our our four year strategy in place, we're able to be able to have those conversations and and bring that council together um, to be able to provide me with some some advice. And we're looking at you know elders and chiefs and economic development agencies and First Nation lenders and others to be able to to, to pull this together and really help us to move that forward. As Lee Eve mentioned, the uh, can do training critical, um, very important. We're, we're um, putting our first staff person through that training right now. Um, and then once we get you know, started on that and we can refine our processes, then we'll be able to move people through. But right now we're trying to get people trained and recognized in certifications and networks built in a variety of different areas. And as one is completed, we'll just kind of rotate people through all of the various programs because there's so many great ones out there. We don't want to have all of our skills concentrated in one area. But the First Nations, Métis, Northern Affairs communities are critical to our economic future. Okay. Do in Manitoba, um, so in Saskatchewan, we have some strong provincial Métis and uh, First Nations organizations that work in the business development and economic development space. Do you have similar organizations in Manitoba? Absolutely. Well? Absolutely. Okay. So some of the organizations that um, that we have would be the uh, Louis Rail um, Development Corporation. We've got um, First Peoples. There is Southern Chiefs has an economic development corporation. Um, many of the tribal councils have economic development leadership within them. Uh, Manitoba Métis Federation has just launched an economic development program with a series of economic development staff around the province that's weeks old and we're still connecting and, and making, you know, understanding exactly what that um, looks like. And so there's a meeting with that leadership mm -hmm. for me coming up in a couple of weeks to understand it. Eve, I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to connect with the MMF EDO in your area. Do you have anything? No, no, you really did a good job highlighting everything there, Margo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's the MMF one is we like I said, is weeks old. We, you know, we're still waiting to find out exactly what it is. And they're getting their feet under them and, and hiring staff right now. So okay. we're on that in our next discussions. Okay. You're both doing amazing work. Um, thanks so much for sharing. Um before we open it up to to our audience, are you able to share that broadband lead? We we have we have quite an interest in connectivity here at CETA. Um, I'm not at this point. Okay, but I have you in the back of my mind, and I will make introductions <laughs> at the appropriate point, Verona. Okay, I appreciate that. So yeah. Jessica, I'll I'll invite Jessica to uh, come back on. Uh, she's been uh, helping facilitate these webinars, and Jessica can help field any questions from our audience. Jessica is with Meiji Roots Outsourcing, so she's been a great asset to uh, to see it over the last few months. Thank you, Verona. So at this time, does anyone have any questions for our panelists? You could either type them into the chat or you can unmic and um, unmute, sorry, and ask your question. Malcolm. Hi there. Uh, I'm a former municipal council member, uh, but still gets involved in some activities around uh, municipal affairs. So um, a question for Eve. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the strength of the relationship between the RM and the City of Portage. And uh, it, it's been rolling along very well for quite a while. And I'm wondering from your perspective, as somebody who works for these two municipalities, uh, what do you think the keys to that success are, is? Uh, is there anything in particular? And my question, I have a question for Margo as well. Uh, Manitoba went through a pretty significant restructuring of municipalities uh, just a few years ago in terms of some major amalgamations of uh, municipalities. And I'm wondering if you could comment on, on how that's been in relation to the uh, capacity and, and the work that you're doing. Uh, in terms of uh, regional economic development. So those are my two questions, one for Eve, one for Margo, please. 
Do you want me to go first, Marco? Certainly. Okay, Malcolm, thank you so much. I really appreciate the question. And I have to say, I couldn't be prouder uh, for the relationships between our councils. Um, one of, like my main thing is I manage um, personalities and people all the time. However, for me as an EDO, I need to understand that I don't work for the city of Portage or the ORM. I work for the region and I think language and dialogue is the most important thing. Uh, the other thing as well, I would say, is educating and empowering our council and our board on regional economic development and really understanding that what's good for one community is good for the other. And I see that with other municipalities of why they're not as cohesive. It's uh, It's got to do with that communication piece. So definitely when you're talking about municipalities and intermunicipal relationships, also, the other thing is really respecting the vision. You know, the RM's vision for economic development is very different to the city. And it's really as an EDO understanding what those are. That's a perfect, you. <laughs> that's a perfect segue to um, some of my comments. Yeah, the amalgamations are interesting and it very much depends upon where you are. Um, some regions came together very, very easily because they had already been working together and there was natural synergies and personalities and it's just worked very, very well. Um, still hiccups with the logistics of, you know, staff and, you know, taxes and mill rates. And, you know, I can think of one, um, one amalgamation where they had a local police force rather than RCMP and and, you know, the town gets the police there more often than the outer circles. And so how does that affect, affect taxes? And, you know, they came up with a really innovative sliding scale model so that the, the, the larger communities were paying more of the, of the surcharges for tax for the police force than the outer farming communities where they may drive by once a day as opposed to once an hour. So they came up with some really innovative ways of, of making everybody happy around all of that. In other cases, I blame high school sports. Um, you take a bunch of high school uh, rivalries and then all of a sudden that continues um, right through to senior hockey. And then all of a sudden you're trying to amalgamate people and you have this competition that's been there since people were you know, eight, nine, 10 years old and it goes back generations. Some of those amalgamations are having a little bit more of a rocky time in being able to figure out um, exactly what they want and where this everything is it's starting to work its way through because we've now had a couple of elections and and um people are seeing the other side of it but being able to figure it out if you can't figure out out around your own council table then you're not going to be able to build those relationships and those regional relationships that eve has you know the luxury of being able to to work with in so it's um very dependent upon the specifics of the situation. I am hearing more and more talk about um, needing to have regional plans and those municipalities moving past how they go into their own bigger region with the amalgamations and moving into even broader conversations about multiple municipalities coming together. And, you know, Eves is probably the, the most high profile in those examples in Manitoba because they've had so much success and, and big dollar success. But there are other areas that have come together where you've got multiple communities working together and they're working on smaller projects, um, whether it's recreation or tourism, um, those sorts of things that, that they're still pulling together and doing it on a regional basis. So you're starting to see that creep out into, into broader discussions as well. Um, you know, to Eve's point about education, um, I am a huge advocate of the community edge programming and the first few modules, which are really designed for council. And you hear me say that everywhere I go to every counselor that will listen to me, that if there's one thing that they can do, and our research proves it out, um, make sure council is educated in the basics of economic development, because without that, um, you have people talking apples and oranges, 
and they don't end up um, being able to put together cohesive plans. So that foundation is important because if you don't have that, you've got um, leadership with no understanding or expertise trying to make decisions around things that they don't understand. And so it's it's critical um, to be able to start to build those regional plans is to have people talking from the same dial, the same dictionary. Thank you, Margo. So Jennifer Brooks has a, a question. Great insight. Thank you. And good questions. It's a really nice seg into what piqued my interest um, as part of the conversation today. So this is for both Margo and Eve. Thanks so much for sharing your experiences on the call. You talked a lot about building relationships um, and certainly what's good for one is, is good for the other from a regional perspective. Um, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more about, um, you know, an advisory regional um, hub type of model uh, and some inter interconnected areas or some areas where it might be easier to gain traction between different parties to really create value to, for those partners that come to the table. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Do you want to go first, Marv, or do you want me to go first? No, I'll jump in on this one. Um, I keep going back to the fact that every community, every region is different. And for us, it's really understanding what those communities want and need. We have no authority. We have no um, ability to say, this is what you're going to do. We always have to come in. We have to be invited in and we have to come in where we are going to provide incremental value. Um, we have three EDOs across the entire 250,000 square kilometers. And so we can't be everywhere and doing everything for everybody. And so um, being able to take a look at, at building those synergies really depends upon the communities understanding what they want and what they need and what they can contribute to those, those pieces themselves. What we find is that in some areas, it really makes sense for them to come together and they're and they're really looking at things like tourism. Other places are looking at investment attraction and retention. Some places are looking at immigration um, as their strategy. So for us, it's really understanding what their priorities are and then being able to um, to support that. If, if they haven't figured that out themselves, it, then there's not much that we're going to be able to do because then it becomes this top down, Armed says you should do, and it's not for Armed to say, tell anybody what to do. We can talk about best practices, we can talk about options, we can help provide toolkits and facilitate conversations and all of those sorts of things, but ultimately it has to come from a grassroots perspective. Thanks, Margo. Appreciate that. Um, Daphne needs to come from a grassroots perspective. Um, and then segueing into that, Margo, I'm just going to speak, Jennifer, about four models um, that PRED has introduced over the last three years. The first is a synergies group with our industrial stakeholders. So we've all our industrial stakeholders, city, the RM, the province, um, sometimes invest in Canada. And then also we've created a synergies advisory committee that's made up of all our new investors uh, coming to the region. The second one is the Portage Regional Tourism Committee, which is 15 stakeholders. So that is uh, all tourism stakeholders that sit around the table and manage the tourism portfolio. The third one is the Portage Economic Response Team, and that's where your Chamber of Commerce, your Community Futures, ECDEV, the City and the RM all sit down and act as that economic um, advisor, um, economic advisory for regional economic development strategy and how we can do better as a community. And then we also have the regional model being the Portage Regional Economic Development Board, which is 50% uh, RM Council, 50% City Council, and then two members of large. So definitely di different models um, are available, but having the stakeholders that are directly impacted from day one is the biggest uh, success story that we've had in Portage. Yeah, one of the ways that we're going about trying to identify those early opportunities, Jennifer, is to 
um, bring people together into what we're calling connection zones. And what they're going to be is uh, very topical in-person meetings done regionally around areas where we are hoping to spark some interest in conversation. Whether it does or it doesn't, we'll see. So uh, it may be things like energy, immigration, um, uh, development alongside highways is a hot topic in Manitoba, you know, and uh, updating the development plans with highways because there's a lot of land that's sort of sitting there because something might maybe happen one day, which is frustrating people. Um, so but we're looking at a research and data one to help inform where we go with our data site and some of the primary research that we do, uh, those sorts of things. So by, by bringing people together around these conversations, we we see things happening. So we were at, um, we, we did a series of tours last fall where we brought provincial agencies in to talk to local economic development officers. Um, it was an opportunity, and it wasn't directed at business, it was directed at economic development leadership so that they could hear about some of these other pieces of um, programming that they may not necessarily see because it's Winnipeg centric in terms of, of service delivery. It's sitting in a room for an, a, a morning. Uh, one of the, the things that came to light was the challenge around local transportation and being able to get First Nation communities um, and population into where the jobs were. And through the course of that morning, there was a conversation that evolved where the school, where what the, one of the First Nation communities said, well, we've got a bus. And someone else said, well, you know, we could adjust our hours if you could use your bus to get people to work, but that bus was also needed for school. And so there was this whole conversation bubble up out of nowhere, simply because we got people together in a room. And when we left that day, they had more or less penciled out a solution to um, being able to get the First Nations population access to employment in the communities that were nearby, they were looking at how that could in turn tie into, um, you know, if they're doing that anyways, maybe they could get people in and out to medical appointments by set, structuring a schedule. There happened to be somebody from I said in the room who's got an interest in in uh, rural and remote transportation. You know, they were all over it, thinking that they could get funding for it, and this committee emerged out of nowhere to be able to solve this problem. So sometimes it's not about actually going in saying what's your problem sometimes it's just getting people in a room and to say tell us what's going on in your community and what are your challenges and others in the room come up with the answers just sitting there very true thanks so much margo and eve you've both been outstanding really appreciate your time this morning i think we're going to wrap it up it's almost 11. um jessica i think next week is our last webinar number five of five and that is on thursday morning at 10 is that correct yes it is yes it is and it actually touches on the transportation issue in rural saskatchewan so if you're interested in participating by all means register for that session perfect thanks again to our guests and our audience have a have a wonderful week and thanks for joining us this morning Thanks for having us, Rona. I've put my email address in the chat. So if anybody ever wants to reach out, uh, they have that. Feel free. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Bye. Rona, can you. you stay on the line for a second? I want to follow up with you on something else if you have a minute.